Welcome to Dayspring Fellowship. I really am so excited that you've decided to join us for this service. You know, people come to church or watch a church service online for lots of reasons. I don't know why you decided to join us today, but here's something I do know. God is at work in your life, and He's brought you here to this place in this moment to accomplish His purposes. Since people grow here, you will leave changed. I trust His work in your life. So can you. I'm Chris Voigt, and I lead the pastoral team here at Dayspring. We have a fantastic team who work tirelessly to help people grow. We love helping you discover the best path forward to deepening your spiritual roots, whether you are here in the room or watching online, live or on demand at some point in the future. If you are visiting Dayspring today, we want you to know that we are a come as you are kind of church. We don't have any perfect people here. We are all in process, working through our junk, and sometimes that is a messy process. So if you can embrace our mess, we'll embrace yours, and together we'll let God work to clean it all up. And if you're just checking out Jesus and church, this is a safe place to bring your questions and doubts. We're all on a journey, and wherever you are on your journey, welcome. You can learn more about us as a church by exploring our website at dsf.church, by checking out our Facebook page, or contacting us by phone or email. If you need help figuring out the next step to making Dayspring your home church, or if you just have questions, let us know. We'll help you find the answers. For today's service, you can find study questions by selecting Watch from the top menu of our website. And now, let's join our service. A rabbit trail is when a conversation goes somewhere unintended. Uh, the focus goes off script, so to speak. Uh, you're talking about subject A, whatever subject A might be, and then all of a sudden you veered like a cute little bunny into subject B, which may or may not even be related to subject A. We've all experienced rabbit trails in conversations. In fact, uh, we've all been in conversations with that one person who can't ever seem to stay on the main trail. And unless that's you, if we're honest, they can drive us a little nuts because rabbit trails can make it hard to have one conversation, one complete conversation. Uh, and if there are decisions to be made, then they only end up getting delayed. So uh, with that said, before we dive into the Gospel of John, we're gonna start the message today with a rabbit trail. It occurred to me that very few pastors really ever talk about their teaching strategy or the why behind what they decide to teach on from the pulpit. But that, can, that why can be incredibly helpful in framing how you approach the weekend service. Uh, if you've been around day spring for more than a few weeks, you've probably seen this graphic before. Uh, we keep coming back to it. By the way, second rabbit trail here, we go over this graphic in Explore 201, which Michelle just talked about coming up on March 6th. This represents Dayspring's discipleship strategy. Everything we do around here finds its root in this graphic because we take seriously our responsibility to help you grow. And the best way to grow is to know not only where you are right now on your spiritual journey, but what the next stage of growth looks like and what kinds of things help you get there. So no matter how long you've followed Christ, if you haven't gone through Explore 201, you should sign up. Or if you've gotten stuck and need some help figuring out where to go from here, sign up. Okay, back to rabbit trail number one. Uh, even though we are all unique people on a unique journey, the path from spiritual infancy to spiritual adulthood has some common benchmarks. Uh, what we see here are the four stages or phases of spiritual growth. The first column represents those who have not yet decided to follow Christ. They're just exploring. And then from left to right, we have spiritual infancy, sp uh, spiritual uh, childhood, and finally, spiritual adulthood on the far right. Now, remember, this has nothing to do with your actual age. 
It's not even your spiritual age. You can be a lukewarm Christian for a lot of years and not really grow the way God intends. So you can be following Christ for a long time and still be a spiritual infant. This is about how long you have been actively pursuing Jesus. Uh, There's a process of physical development between birth and adulthood. It's similar to our spiritual development, although it doesn't happen automatically like our physical development. Uh, People in these first two columns don't yet know how to feed themselves spiritually yet. Uh, People in the far right column do know how to feed themselves spiritually and own that responsibility. Uh, People in column three are somewhere in between. They need more spiritual food, but may not yet have acquired the tools uh, to prepare what they need to eat. Uh, So they still eat what's put in front of them. Kind of like a teenager might be able to make their own meal, but they need you to do the shopping so that they have all of the ingredients at hand. And no offense to actual teenagers, of course, though they could fix their own meal if mom gave them all the ingredients. They'd rather someone else fixed it for them. Uh, They don't own the responsibility for feeding themselves yet. They aren't adults yet. We think about this when it comes to what we teach on the weekends. Topical sermon series like the one like some of the ones we've just done, like how to get through what you're going through, and if money talked, and lies we believe, and the truth that sets us free. Topical series tend to be more helpful to people who haven't yet learned how to feed themselves, because we more obviously connect the dots between the practical application of God's Word to our daily lives. And honestly, Everyone, regardless of spiritual age, approaches the Bible this way, most of the time. When you're dealing with anxiety, you don't go, I'm having anxious thoughts. I think I'll read Ezekiel to see what that book might have to say. Or I'm having trouble loving my neighbor well. I think I'll read Revelation. No, we have a topic and we Google or we use a commentary or some other method to find biblical answers. So done well, a topical sermon series also teaches us how to appropriately find those verses that apply to our topic with respect to the context of the verse. So that we aren't trying to mold God's Word to fit our needs, but allowing our needs to be satisfied by God's Word. Studies that focus on a specific book of the Bible, on the other hand, like we're beginning today, are designed to be more helpful to spiritual teenagers they begin to unpack the layers of meaning behind the English words on the page. The ancient rabbis believed that every word or phrase in the original language of the Bible was like a gemstone with 70 facets. You look at it one way and you see one meaning, but then you turn it and you you see that it can also mean something else just as beautiful. This is what makes the Word of God living and active. When we go through a book study like the Gospel of John, we are helping to reveal different facets of God's Word. Uh, Those of you who are in the far right category could eat up facet after facet and would prefer that the weekend message be just that. However, many of our Dayspring family aren't yet spiritual adults. So those of you who are in this far right category are going to have to go deeper on your own, which is okay because you are equipped and motivated to do so. And if you aren't, then you aren't a spiritual adult yet. And that's why we spend more time looking at the Bible topically. We have more people still learning how to eat, let alone feed themselves. Now, for you, as we go through John, your job is to watch the kinds, watch for the kinds of signs that indicate that there might be a facet that needs more exploring. And you're also going to have to look a little bit harder to figure out the practical application for your life. That's okay. It will help you grow, which is what we're all about at Dayspring. So now, depending on where you are in your spiritual growth, you have your marching orders for this next series. And with that, back to our regularly scheduled conversation on subject A, (laughs) the Gospel of John. (laughs) Let's pray. (laughs) Uh, Father, in these moments now, 
wherever we are on our spiritual journey, whether we're just exploring what Jesus is all about or we've just crossed the line into our, our spiritual journey with Jesus or we've been following Jesus um, like King David did for years and years and years, wherever we are on that journey, the Word of God is living and active and able to meet each one of us where we are. And we pray that today the Holy Spirit would do His perfect work in our lives wherever we are. We pray in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay, if you have your Bible in any form, whether physical or old school, hard copy or electronic, uh, go ahead and get yourself situated at the beginning of John. Uh, Most of us know that there are four Gospels in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Each one was written by a different author to it a different audience for a different purpose, which is why it can be a little hard for us some 2,000 years later to understand why they're all a little different. At first glance, it can even seem like they contradict each other. They don't, for the record, but it's, it's easy to see why they, it might seem like they do. Matthew was a Jewish tax collector before following Jesus. He wrote his gospel as a Jew to the Jews, trying to convince them that Jesus was the promised Messiah of the Old Testament. He wrote to connect the dots between what the Old Testament had to say about this coming Messiah to Jesus, emphasizing his regal rights uh, as the Messiah and legitimate king of Israel. Mark was not one of the 12 disciples. He was the son of a Jesus follower named Mary and was a close associate of Barnabas, Paul, and Peter. We see him show up in the book of Acts. Uh, Most theologians agree that if Peter didn't actually dictate his story in the Gospel of Mark, he was at the very least the source of Mark's information. Mark was a Roman writing to the Romans, presenting Jesus as the ultimate servant. Uh, He presents Jesus from a practical, action-oriented point of view, which you see in the phrase, and immediately throughout the gospel, depending on the translation you might be using. Uh, The Romans respected deep thinkers, but looked to men of action for leadership. Mark shows Jesus to be the no-nonsense God who came from heaven to complete a task. Now, we talked quite a bit about Luke last year in our series, The Bible for Grownups, which is available online if you need a refresher. Luke was probably a Macedonian doctor, but for sure he was a Gentile, not a Jew. Like Mark, he wasn't a disciple of Jesus, but after the resurrection, he did all of the investigative work to write an orderly account of Jesus' life and ministry. As a Greek, he wrote his gospel to common Greeks, uh, most of whom had no power, no wealth, no privilege, and no hope. Greeks valued perfection in body, mind, and spirit. Uh, Luke presents Jesus as the perfect man, highlighting the humanity of Jesus, Jesus, favoring the title Son of Man, and providing details about his humble birth, his ordinary boyhood, his compassion for the poor and sick, and the global scope of his ministry, which would have resonated with his Greek audience. All three of these Gospels were written before the Gospel of John, which was written at the end of John's life in about 100 A.D., Uh, John certainly would have known of these Gospels and maybe even taught from them, but at some point with the leading of the Holy Spirit would have come to recognize that together they still didn't offer a complete picture of Jesus. Yes, Jesus was the King of the Jews. Yes, Jesus was the suffering servant. Yes, Jesus was the Son of Man, but he was also the Son of God. God himself in the flesh completely human and completely God, no less so than when in the beginning he spoke the universe into existence. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the synoptic gospels because they describe the events of Jesus' life and ministry from a similar viewpoint. Synoptic comes from the Greek word that means able to be seen together. 
Uh, these gospels complement each other and focus on the events of Jesus' life. John, on the other hand, contains no childhood details he, and retells no parables. He bypasses Jesus' temptation in the wilderness, his transfiguration on the mountain, his commissioning of the disciples after the resurrection and his ascension from the earth. He doesn't even offer Jesus' genealogy, illustrating that as God, Jesus had no beginning. Instead, he writes from a philosophical and theological perspective, and where the synoptic gospels focus on events, John adds meaning to those events, placing F emphasis on the miracles of Jesus, which he calls signs. For example, all four Gospels record the feeding of the 5,000, but only John records Jesus' sermon on the bread of life. He gave us the meaning behind the miracle. Because for John, these miracles were more than just events designed to grab people's attention. They were proof, the evidence that the Word had become flesh to give all of humanity reason to believe in Jesus, leaving no excuse for doubt. Now, put another way, Matthew says, this is the Messiah, the King, worship him. Mark says, this is the servant who served humanity, follow him. Luke says, this is the only man among men without sin, emulate him. John says, this is God in human flesh, believe in him. John isn't writing to simply give us more information about Jesus. He wants us to believe in Jesus. In fact, that word in the original language appears 98 times in the Gospel of John. For John, to believe isn't just about head knowledge about Jesus. It isn't just accepting the historical person of Jesus that he lived at some point in time. It isn't simply admiring him or emulating him or believing in his cause. It is, of course, all of those things. The original Greek word does mean to acknowledge the truth as truth. But even more than that, to believe is to accept what he says as truth, and even more importantly, to trust, to rely in, to derive confidence in him. Everything I know about life, everything I know about whatever occurs after life is dependent upon his claims about himself and how I respond to his offer of grace. I believe in Jesus Christ. John wants everyone to believe in, put their trust in, and surrender their lives to Jesus. And for those of us who already follow Christ, we have a responsibility to share Jesus with others. What makes the Gospel of John important for us is understanding and being able to communicate who Jesus said he was. Uh, most people will acknowledge that there was a historical person named Jesus who was probably a good man, even a prophet. But that's not who Jesus said he was. Jesus said he was God. And if that is true, then it should change everything. Because if he wasn't God, then he was a liar or a con man or a lunatic. But if he is actually God, that's a game changer. Jesus claimed to be God. And John provides the supernatural proof to back up those words. In fact, that's where he starts in this first chapter. Uh, John recorded seven names and titles of Jesus that identify him as eternal God. And we're going to unpack each of them as we get to them. But don't miss the, pro the progression as we work uh, from verses 1 through 18. From infinity and eternity down to the single individual Christ. In whom all of that infinite and eternal reside. So starting in verse 1, John writes this, in the beginning the Word already existed. The Word was with God and the Word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through Him and nothing was created except through Him. 
So this, the, the first title John gives us for Jesus is the Word. Around 500 BC, a Greek noble, nobleman named Heraclitus taught that the universe operates according to a rational structure, a unified ordering principle. And if we carefully observe this, its patterns and solve its riddles, we can observe this structure. According to this theory, all the laws of physics, mathematics, reason, and morality can be traced back to this ordering principle, which he called logos, or the word. Now, over time, other philosophers and philosophies, such as the Stoics and the Gnostics, jumped on the logos bandwagon. Ephesus was not, not only the birthplace of this idea, but it was the center of of this Greek philosophy. Enter John, who was writing his gospel, most likely in Ephesus. And all of these secular influences threatened to corrupt Christian doctrine. We talked about Gnosticism in particular in our series from 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, How Do You Recognize a Christian? If you missed that series, you might want to go back and watch. You'll find it along with several others on our website. Uh, what John did here was genius. He affirmed the parts of Greek philosophy that were valid. He found common ground in order to preach the truth of Christ. He met them where they were in what they already believed and then led them to Christ. Just as our words reveal our hearts and minds to others, Jesus Christ is God's word revealing his heart and mind to us and words matter. Words are made of individual letters, and Revelation tells us that Jesus is the Alpha and Omega, the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. Hebrews 1 tells us that Jesus is God's last word to mankind. He is the climax of divine revelation. As such, Jesus Christ is the eternal word. Verses 1 and 2. He existed in the beginning because he is eternal. He is God and he was with God. By the way, even without mentioning the Holy Spirit here, this verse is an important uh, support for the theology of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. All three the same and all distinct. Verse 3 tells us that he is the creative word. God created all things through Jesus Christ, which means Jesus was not a created being, but a creating being, making him the eternal God. Now, the verb here in Greek is in perfect tense, which means nothing to any of us. Uh, but it means that creation was a completed act. Creation is finished. Even though God is at work in his creation, Creation is not a process, but a finished work. This parallels Genesis 1, the old creation, and now new creation. Also, while we're still on this title of Jesus, let's drop down to verse 14 for a second. Jesus is the eternal word and the creative word and the incarnate word. This is where we, we see the eternal and the infinite find its way into one single individual. Verse 14, so the word became human and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness, and we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. So where our words are just air, and usually hot air at that, God's word has substance. Jesus wasn't a ghost or phantom as the Gnostics believed. He was flesh and blood, which means, which is what incarnate means. He was weary, he was thirsty, he groaned, he wept, he, he bled and died, just like we do. Even though the primary focus of John's gospel is Jesus as God, we must never forget that in addition to being fully God, he was also fully man, both and, not either or. Even after the resurrection, Jesus proved his physical body was real by allowing it to be touched and seen and heard. John wanted people to understand that the word wasn't an abstract philosophical concept. The word wasn't just 
heir. The Word was a real person. He is the revelation of God's glory, which is an important theme in these pages. Jesus revealed God's glory in his person, his works, and his words. The seven miracles John records declare the glory of God, which far outshines the glory of the Old Covenant, which was a fading glory. Because the law could reveal sin, but it could never remove sin. Now, here's a thought. What does Jesus, the Word, reveal in you? Now, let's move on to verse 4. The Word gave life to everything that was created, and this life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. Now, the second title that John gives us for Jesus is the light. The word life is a key theme in the Gospel of John. John uses the word 36 times. So here in verse 4, we see the word gave life to every created being. Nothing remains alive apart from him. Uh, There are at least four components that are essential for life. Light, if the sun went out, everything would die. Air, water, and food. All must be present to give and sustain life. Jesus is all of these, as we'll come to see in the weeks to come. By the Holy Spirit, he gives us the breath of life. We'll see that in chapters 3 and 20. Chapters 4 and 7 describe him as the water of life. And John 6 tells us that Jesus is the bread of life. But here, he is the light of life. John 8 says that he is the light of the world. Malachi describes him as the son, S-U-N, not S-O-N, the son of righteousness. Light is and dark are recurring themes, not only in John's gospel, but in his letters as well. God is light, while Satan is the power of darkness. People either love the light or the darkness. Now, literally translated, John 1.5 says, and the light keeps on shining in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it or understood it. The Greek verb can mean either to overcome or to grasp or understand. And we see both attitudes throughout the gospel, growing uh, in in the growing opposition to Jesus that sought to overcome him and his ministry and their inability to understand what he was saying. But the light just keeps shining. So let's pause again to consider this. As Jesus, the light, what does he look like when he shines through you. Now, from here, the disciple John summarizes what John the Baptist had to say about Jesus. John the Baptist is one of the most important people in the New Testament. He is mentioned at least 89 times. Uh, He had the privilege of introducing Jesus to the nation of Israel, but began with the task of preparing them for his coming. The disciple John had a front row seat to the work of John the Baptist. The disciple John was first a disciple of John the Baptist. But when Jesus came on the scene, the disciple John, along with probably Andrew, went to check out Jesus and ended up becoming two of his 12 disciples. So let's skip down to verse 15 and see what John says uh, that... uh, what John says we learn from John the Baptist about Jesus. Now, this is some time after Jesus' baptism. Uh, Verse 15, John, that is John the Baptist, testified about him when he shouted to the crowds, this is the one I was talking about when I said "Someone someone is coming after me who is far greater than I am, for he existed long before me. Now, this is the first thing that we learn about Jesus from John the Baptist. He tells us that Jesus is eternal. In the physical world, that wasn't true. Uh, Baptist John was Jesus' cousin and was born a few months before Jesus. Uh, This statement is referring to Jesus' pre-existence, not his birth date. Uh, Jesus existed before John was ever conceived. Verse 16, from his abundance, we have all received one gracious blessing after another. 
For the law was given through Moses, but God's unfailing love and faithfulness came through Jesus Christ. So the second thing that Baptist John teaches us about Jesus is that he is the fullness of grace and truth. The perfect balance of God's favor and kindness to people who don't deserve or could never earn it, and the truth that what we have earned and deserve is condemnation for our sin. But because Jesus met all of the requirements of the law, he only deals with us with grace, which is a good thing because we'd never survive it if it were only truth. And then finally, Baptist John teaches us that Jesus reveals God to us. Verse 18, no one has ever seen God, but the unique one who is himself God is near to the Father's heart. He has revealed God to us. Now Colossians tells us that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. And Hebrews, that he is the express image and character of God. Uh, in this verse, the next title of Jesus gets lost in translation. But where you see the words unique one here in the New Living Translation, the New American Standard Bible translates it as the only begotten God. What Baptist John is saying that is that Jesus is the Son of God, which is the first time that we see this title for Jesus in John's Gospel, given that we're only 18 verses in, that's no big surprise. But overall, he will use this title at least nine times in the pages to come. Jesus, the Son of God. What does Jesus, the Son of God, reveal about God to you? Okay, now let's jump down to verse 29 uh, for the next title. The next day, Baptist John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And then the next day, in verse 36, as Jesus walked by, again, Baptist John looked at him and declared, Look, there is the Lamb of God. So Jesus is the Lamb of God. Now, I'm not really sure what was going on in this scene. It feels like it was a multi-day Billy Graham-like evangelistic event where Baptist John was the Billy Graham of the day. And Jesus is just gearing up his ministry. Maybe he's already finished his 40 days in the desert, since when you read these verses later on your own, you'll see that John is remembering the time that he baptized Jesus. So maybe Jesus is fresh off of backpacking in the wilderness and looking to begin his public ministry. The Jews would have been very familiar with lambs for sacrifices. At, at Passover, they needed a lamb. Every day of the year, two lambs were sacrificed in the temple, one in the morning and one in the evening. Add in all of the lambs brought for personal sacrifices, and you'd have a plethora of lambs and people very familiar with what Baptist John meant, even if they didn't really get how Jesus fit into the picture. But John and Jesus knew that Baptist John's baptism of Jesus was a foreshadowing of the baptism into death that would occur on the cross when the Lamb of God died for the sins of the world before being raised to newness of life three days later. Now, when you, when you think about Jesus, the Lamb of God, what comes to mind? What does this facet of Jesus mean for you? In John's gospel, we are now three days into this sequence of days that disciple John is recounting for us. The seventh day would, would be the wedding in Cana that we read about in chapter 2. Traditionally, Jewish weddings were held on Wednesdays. So if you count backwards, that means this third day is the Sabbath. John was preaching and Jesus was collecting disciples. And verse 37 tells us that this is when disciple John and Andrew left Baptist John to join up with Jesus. And after a meeting of the minds, verse 40 tells us that Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of these men who heard what John said and then followed Jesus. Andrew went to find his brother Simon and told him, we have found the Messiah, which means Christ bringing us to the fifth title that John uses for Jesus, the Messiah. Messiah is a Hebrew word that means anointed. It is the Greek equivalent of Christ. 
To the Jews, it was the same as Son of God. As a side note, now make that a little tiny rabbit trail. That means that Christ isn't Jesus' last name. Christ is a title, which means the Messiah. In the Old Testament, prophets, priests, and kings were anointed and thereby set apart for service. Kings were called God's anointed. So from the Jewish perspective, the Messiah was their king who would come to deliver them from Roman rule and establish his kingdom, which was part of the confusion for the Jews when it came to Jesus. He didn't act very kingly. We have the blessing of experiencing these words on the other side of the cross, uh, but even still, like the Jews, we often get it wrong when it comes to our expectations for the Messiah. So who is Jesus, the Messiah, to you? Now, obviously, Simon, who became Peter, joined up. And it doesn't say it here, but disciple John also got his brother James on board. And then Philip joined the gang, and he uh, went and told Nathaniel, who was a little skeptical about Jesus. Uh, verse 46. Nazareth, exclaimed Nathaniel, can anything good come from Nazareth? Come and see for yourself, Philip replied. As they approached, Jesus said, now here in Nathaniel is a genuine son of Israel, a man of complete integrity. How do you know about me? Nathaniel asked. Jesus replied, I could see you under the fig tree before Philip found you. Then Nathanael exclaimed, Rabbi, you are the son of God, the king of Israel. And the sixth title for Jesus comes from the skeptic, the king of Israel. Now it gets lost in translation, but Jesus actually called Nathanael an Israelite in whom there is no guile which is certainly a reference to Jacob of old, the ancestor of the Jews, who was a man of guile, who tricked his brother, father and father-in-law, before an encounter with God changed his name and character to Israel, a prince with God. King of Israel is a title similar to Messiah, anointed one, because as I said earlier, all of Israel's kings were God's anointed. But even though Jesus did present himself as a king in John chapter 12, and he affirmed to Pilate that he was born a king, he refused to let people make him a king. As American Christians, we don't really understand what it means to have a king. We have presidents and governors and mayors who, de who we decide get to serve us, not rule over us. We don't really have to obey them as we would if we lived in another age and time. They aren't really sovereign over us. So with that in mind, is that how you relate to Jesus, the king of Israel? Is he really your king? By the way, an, another rabbit trail is Nathaniel himself. Some scholars believe that Nathaniel and the disciple Bartholomew mentioned in the other gospels are the same person. John never mentions Bartholomew and the other gospels never mention Nathaniel. So while it is possible that Nathaniel and Bartholomew were two men, it's more likely that it was simply Nathaniel Bartholomew, much like it was Simon Peter, and the Apostle Paul was Saul Paul, where one was his Jewish name and the other was his Roman name. And then last but not least, coming from Jesus himself, is the seventh title. Still talking to Nathaniel, Jesus asked him, do you believe this just because I told you I had seen you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than this. Then he said, I tell you the truth. You will all see heaven and earth and the angels of God going up and down on the Son of Man, the one who is the stairway between heaven and earth. Jesus called himself the Son of Man. A son of man was one of Jesus' favorite titles for himself. It is used 83 times in the Gospels and at least 13 times in John. The title speaks of both the deity and the humanity of Jesus. As the son of man, Jesus is the living link between heaven and earth, which explains the reference to Jacob's ladder in Genesis 28. Jacob thought he was alone, but God sent the angels to guard and protect him and to guide him. Christ 
is God's ladder between heaven and earth. And in using these words, Jesus reveals his ultimate purpose for coming to earth, to bridge the gap caused by sin between God and man. Now, most of us here in the room and watching online have crossed that bridge. Even still, I'd guess there are times when we think we're alone, much like Jacob felt back then. But how does that feeling align with what we know about Jesus, the Son of Man? Now, at the close of this fourth day, Jesus has gathered six of his 12 disciples. Little did they know what was to come in the next three years and how much their lives would change. Which brings us to chapter 2. But before we move on, think about these seven titles for Jesus. The Word, the Light, Jesus, the Son of God, the Lamb of God, Jesus, the Messiah, the King of Israel, the Son of Man. Seven facets of Jesus. Now, I guess that if, if you had a little more time to just really uh, think about those seven titles, that uh, one or two of those facets would resonate in your spirit more than the others. That resonance is probably related to your life experience to the way you met Jesus, what you need or needed from him in order to relate to him on a meaningful, life-changing level. It's what connected you enough to surrender your life to him. I think John gave us seven facets of Jesus for much the same reason we have four gospels written by different people to different audiences. Whoever you are, whatever you've been through, wherever you're going, there is Jesus. He isn't just Jesus for the Jews. He's not Jesus for white people or Jesus for black people or brown people. He's far more than Jesus for the rich or the poor. He's not just Jesus for those who have their their act together or those who are completely broken. He is certainly Jesus for the marginalized, but he is also Jesus for the non-marginalized. He's Jesus for the addict the abused, the abuser, the lonely, the hurting. He's even Jesus for those who don't think they need Jesus. He is Jesus for everyone. He is the God who reveals himself to everyone, who loves everyone. Who is Jesus to you? Now, we clearly don't have time to cover chapter 2 today, which is fantastic because that means you have some homework to do. We'll begin in chapter 3 next week. So wherever you are on your spiritual journey, at whatever level you are able to, work your way through chapter 2 on your own. That might mean that you just read chapter 2. It might mean that you dive deep and uncover facet after facet of beauty. Again, it depends on where you are on your spiritual journey. There is no wrong answer here. Just do something. We've included a couple of questions in the discussion guide online to help you, to help guide you. When it comes to the practical application of this chapter, let me point you in this direction. As Christ followers, we are called to share Jesus with people far from God. We aren't responsible for what happens when we share. We're just called to share and to trust that God will do whatever God will do with the seed that we sow. The best way to share Christ is to help them meet Jesus in that place in their lives where they need Jesus to show up. Usually that's in their greatest source of pain. Jesus has a title for that. So who can you love there? Look at the people in this chapter who came because of an invitation. A simple come and see, which we'll see again in John's Gospel. So who are you inviting to come and see? Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful for Jesus. Thankful that Jesus is faceted enough that he can meet any person where they are. That he can connect with any person regardless of background or time in history or uh, experience in life 
And Father, for those of us who have already made the decision to follow Christ, amen and thank you, Jesus. But what is probably true as well is that there are people maybe even in the room watching online now or later who have never crossed the bridge, the, 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 the bridge of Jesus that covers the gap created because of our sin. And if that describes you, then today's the day. All you have to do is say, yes, yes, I believe in Jesus. Yes, I acknowledge that my sin has broken that relationship, has made it impossible for me to ever be good enough to get to heaven on my own, to have a relationship with God on my own. But I say yes to Jesus. It really is that simple. What happens from here is a little more complicated, a little harder. Dying to yourself takes time. It's a lifelong journey that we are privileged to be on, as hard as it may be sometimes. There's no reason to delay. You don't have to have your act together before you uh, receive what Jesus has to offer, which is life now and eternal. Now, if that describes you, I want to invite you to say yes, but then take one more step. Let me know. God never intended for anyone to experience the Christian journey alone. He, he's called us into community. We are better in community. We grow better in community. So let me know. You can do that with the communication card. You can email me. But let me know. Tell someone. We pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. Let me encourage you to download the study questions by selecting Watch from the top menu of our website. Working through those questions alone or with others will help the truth of God's Word find its place in your life. Please reach out if you have any questions or want help on your spiritual journey. My email address is on the screen, or you can call the church during the week. This ministry is made possible because of people like you, people who believe in what God is doing through Dayspring. Your financial generosity is proof of God's work in your life. If you're just checking us out today, please know that we don't expect you to give anything to support Dayspring. That is the responsibility of our Dayspringers. Just enjoy the rest of your day. If you'd like to start giving, we have three easy ways for you to get us your gift. Please see the online giving section of our website or text GIVE to the number on your screen or mail a check to us at the address you'll find on our website. Also. Thank you for liking and sharing and following Dayspring on whatever platform you're on. It means a lot to me when you pass on the good news of Jesus to your friends and family. Until next week, may you experience God's favor and blessing in your life.